The first thing that I want to talk to you guys about is how to open up your files from different programs. This is a question we get all the time. People get confused because there are lots of different menus and lots of different ways that you can get to the suite. So I'm going to talk to you about how to get to it from Photoshop, from Lightroom, and from Aperture. So let's start here inside Photoshop. Now I've got, I've got it open right now. I've got a file open already. This is a PSD file. There's nothing that's been done to it. It's just a basic PSD file. And on the right hand side of the screen, you should see right over here, there's an on one software panel and the on one software panel, the on one software panel on the right hand side should pop up when you get the suite. So you install it on your computer. As long as you have Photoshop, it'll automatically load those plugins for you. Now, if you don't see it, all you need to do is go up to the window menu, go down to extensions and make sure that the on one is checked and that'll pop that panel up. Now, another way that you can get to the program is by going to the file menu in Photoshop and going down to automate. And that's where you're going to see all of the different modules as well. So two different ways to get to the suite and they'll work in a very similar way. Let's say for instance, I want to take this image into perfect effects. All I need to do is go to my panel, click on perfect effects. And right here at the top, it says open perfect effects Four. once I double click it, it's going to open this photo inside effects. And now if I want to, I can add a vintage styling. I can go in and I could warm the photo up even more so that it looks like it's got kind of that sunny ray to it. So let's go ahead and do that. Now I'm inside perfect effects right now, and I'm going to do a quick overview of this program. On the left hand side, you have your effects library. The effects library is where you get all of the different categories of the effects that are here inside perfect effects. So you'll see everything separated down into some pretty, pretty basic ideas. You've got your movie looks, you've got your landscape specific presets, you've got HDR stylings here. One of my favorite categories is the sunshine category. And all you do is click on a category to pop it open and you get all of these really nice high res previews of what the effect is going to look like on your image. So here's my photo with the sun glow filter on top. And this is a really great way to work. And it's one of the reasons why I love working with perfect effects is it can be kind of hard when someone just labels a preset, but you can't actually see what it looks like on your photo. Now, when I find, uh, when I find an effect that I like and I want to apply it, all I need to do is click on it and it'll add it to my image. So it went into this photo, it saturated it a little bit more, added a bit more contrast and warmed it up a tad. If I decide I don't like this effect for whatever reason, instead of having to go over and delete something and then add another effect on top of it, you can scroll through and click through effects really easily. So I'm going to open up another category, the vintage category, which is one of my favorites. I use this all the time. And I'm just going to scroll through until I find one that I really like. There we go. I'm going to choose this honky tonk effect. Now I don't really like this radiance effect. I don't like what it's doing to the image. So I'll just click on the honky tonk effect and it instantly replaces the last one that I applied. So it's really easy to just kind of click through these effects and add them to your images very, very fast. Now, You'll also notice that in the bottom right hand corner of each one of these presets on the left hand side, there's a little flag and the flag indicates whether I've saved this as a favorite. All of my favorites get placed in my favorites library. And the favorites library is a great way to work in set effects because it allows you to separate all of the effects that you use on a regular basis from the ones that you know you don't like to use. So inside my favorites library, these are all the ones I use on a pretty regular basis. There's a detail, there's a, a preset for adding detail, all of my favorite vintage effects are in here and so on. So to add something as a favorite, all you need to do is click inside that flag and it'll add it to that library for you. Now on the right hand side in my effects stack, you'll see that there is the honky tonk effect layer. Now I want to go back into Photoshop and I'm finished here inside perfect effects. We'll be going back in here in a little bit later. I just want to show you kind of a quick overview here. So I'm going to click on the apply button on the bottom right hand corner of my screen. Once I click apply, it puts me back into Photoshop and you'll see on the right hand side, 
it's added this perfect effect styling that I applied as a separate layer. This is one of the best parts about working with the suite. Working inside Photoshop and with the suite, pretty much any program that you're going to be working with, it doesn't really matter. We strive really, really hard to make sure that you don't destroy your original image. So I have this effects layer on top of that original background layer, and I don't have to worry about destroying that original image. If I decide that I don't like this, all I need to do is click the trash button on the bottom right hand side of my layer stack, and I can get rid of that perfect effects layer. So it's really, really great. You have access to this layered workflow so that your original photo is still there here inside Photoshop. Everything will automatically be applied as a separate layer for you. Now that we've gone through Photoshop, I'm actually going to hide Photoshop and we're going to swap over to Aperture. I'm going to save Lightroom for last. So I've got Aperture open right here. And inside Aperture, there are two different ways that you can get into the suite. The first, let me go to my full screen so I can see all of my different images here. When I choose an image that I want to edit, all I need to do is right click that image or control click that image and I'm going to scroll up to edit with plugin. And here you're going to see all of the different plugins that you have access to using. So I could take this into, let's say I wanted to take it into focal point and I wanted to blur the background out a little bit, maybe the sky. Let's say I wanted to take this into perfect black and white and turn this into a black and white image. Any of these plugins I have access to here. And what's really, really great about going through Aperture, edit with plugin. Let's say I want to take this into perfect black and white. Once I select perfect black and white, it'll put me into the program really quick. And it's going to process this image for me. And there we go. Now this was a raw file. This was originally a raw file and I had made some I had made some light changes to it, but for the most part, it was pretty much straight out of camera. I lightened it a little bit. That's pretty much it. Now, here inside perfect black and white, on the left-hand side of the screen, is your effects library. And this is just the same as inside Perfect Effects. You have all of your different categories that you can open up. So let's say I wanted to open up the 20th Century Classic Silver category, and I can take a look at all the different black and white presets that are here inside this category. You'll see we've got flags here, so I can flag my favorites just like we did inside Perfect Effects. So to apply an effect, I just click once, and it'll add it to my image. If I decide that I don't like it and I don't want to try something else, I can just click on another effect. So again, you can scroll through and click through really, really easily here. And it, it makes it a lot, it makes it a lot quicker to get in and out. So I'm going to choose Ansel in the Valley there, the one that I originally started with. I've selected that preset. On the right hand side of my screen, I have a whole bunch of panes that I have access to. I can edit things such as tone. So if I want to do really simple stuff like brighten up my image a little bit, if it was a little too dark, maybe I want to add a little bit more contrast to really intensify the look of the image. I can also edit things such as detail, and the detail slider is great because it goes in and it adds just a little bit of edge contrast to your image, so it looks like your photo is just a little bit more detailed and a little bit sharper. So sometimes if you have a photo that looks a little dull, if you take that detail slider over to the right, it'll just crisp it up a little bit, and that's always really nice. So I can take my detail slider and play around with that. Now the other thing inside Perfect Black and White that I, I want to touch on really quickly before we pop back into Aperture is the color response pane. And it's right underneath the tone pane here on the right hand side. And black and white works based on color information. And that sounds a little weird at first, but your original color image is still there. It's underneath this black and white layer that was popped on top of it. So if I turn my preview button on and off, which is Control or Command P, my original image, all that color information is still there. And when I turn my preview back on, there's my black and white layer kind of on top of that color image. I can go in and I can edit each one of these color channels and lighten and darken them separately. So here inside the color response pane, all I need to do is choose a slider. So I could take, for instance, the green slider. And if I move it to the left, it'll darken any greens. And if I move it to the right, it'll lighten greens. And you'll see it's it's lightening and darkening this kind of greenish aqua-ish area down at the bottom. And I can do this with all of the different sliders. So you'll see the yellow slider affects a lot of the foliage on the mountains there. And I could brighten those up. Or if I wanted kind of a more, a darker kind of silhouette in the front, I could take that yellow slider and move it to the left. 
So these sliders are a great way to customize your image and do kind of larger selective edits to your photo. Now, here inside black and white, once I'm done and I'm ready to go, I'll click the apply button. And it's gonna add all those different things that it's done to my image, all the tone changes, whether there were toner changes, so if it had a little bit of color or grain, if there was a vignette, it goes through and it processes the image for us. And then it's gonna pop us back into Aperture. So it's gonna save this photo and pop it back into Aperture. And what's really, really great about working with Aperture is it automatically creates that second copy for you. So you'll see inside my library, here's my original image completely in color, and right next to it is my new black and white image. And now I could go in and crop it. I could edit out that top part in the right-hand corner. I could edit out some of these little dust spots if I want to. If I need to make any other changes, I have access to this new version and my original color version. So that's one of the plus sides of working with Aperture, and, and one of the plus sides of working with the suite is we automatically help create that digital copy for you so your original photo is still there. Now I'm going to go ahead and hide Aperture and we're going to move on to Lightroom. Now here inside Lightroom there are two different ways that you have access to the suite. And I'm going to show you both of those ways. So I'm going to start out with a raw file. This is what most people shoot with. Most people have raw files. They, it's, it's a setting on your camera that you get to use and raw files are great because you have access to the entire tonal range of an image and being able to edit all of those different ranges. It collects so much information, it's absolutely unbelievable. So raw files are what most photographers shoot, so that's what I'm gonna be talking about today mostly. So once we have an image that we want to go in and edit, we've got this photo here. I wanna take it in and I want to edit out these little power lines, I guess. I want to edit out these power lines in the top part of my, on the top part of my screen, and then I want to take it into perfect effects. Now, one of the best parts about working with the suite and using Lightroom and Aperture is you have access to using the entire suite and going from module to module, and that's what we're going to do here. So with this image open, I'll go to the file menu and go down to plug in extras, and this is the first way that you can find all of the different plugins here inside Lightroom. So file menu down to plugin extras and you'll see all of the different modules from there. Now you'll see right up at the top, there's the perfect photo suite seven. It's just labeled right there at the top and this is a great way to jump into the suite and access those multiple modules all together. So I always like to start out here if I know I need to do a little bit of basic editing or I wanna go in and then I wanna add an effect or maybe I wanna take it into resize, get it ready to print. So I like to go through the file plugin extras menu because I like to access the whole suite at once. And that's what this option here is right up at the top. So we'll take this into the perfect photo suite here. All right, so we're here inside the photo suite and I've got my image open. And the first thing that you'll notice right up at the top of my screen, so this was originally a raw file and it's automatically copied this file over and created a PSD. So just like inside Photoshop where it created that second layer, it goes in and it creates an automatic digital copy and creates a PSD file for you. It's one of the many, many benefits of working with raw files is that digital copy is always going to be there and your original will always exist. So it's already done the hard work for you. It, it created that copy. And now I can go in not worrying about destroying my original photo. Now the first thing I need to do here inside Perfect Layers is I want to get rid of those power lines there. And there's a tool on the left hand side of your, of your preview here in the little toolbar and it's called the retouch brush. And once I select it, this allows you to go in and get rid of any excess areas in your photo. So if you have someone who's got a couple quick blemishes, maybe there's a bird in the sky you wanna get rid of, this retouch brush is there to kind of cover all of those little spots for you. So I'm gonna make my brush a little bit bigger now to make your brush bigger or smaller, little keyboard shortcut for you are the left and right bracket keys on your keyboard. So if you use the right bracket key, it makes it bigger. And if you use the left bracket key, it makes it smaller. 
And that just makes, that makes resizing that brush a little bit easier there. Now, once I've resized my brush, I'm just going to click and drag over these power lines here. And we're going to get into this area here where it's going to start to get a little bit more difficult. But I can click and drag across larger areas and it'll remove quite a bit of these power lines for me. Now, when you reach an area that gets a little difficult, like this one here, there's a great option for you. It's called the clone brush. And the clone brush is there to kind of help get rid of some of those harder to reach spots. So I'm gonna turn the clone brush on by clicking on the use clone brush checkbox in your tool options bar. Now, you have to make sure that you have the retouch brush selected in your tool area, your toolbar on the left-hand side to have access to that clone brush. So always remember that. So I'm gonna turn use clone brush on. Now the way that the clone brush works is actually, it's really cool and it's really, really useful. I'm gonna take my brush and I'm gonna hold the option key. And you'll see when I have the option key held down on my keyboard, there's this little crosshair that pops up. And this is where we're going to select the part of the image that's similar to the color information over and around these power lines. So I'm just going to click over here where the sky is. And once I click once, I'm going to let go. And when I drag my brush over the power lines, you'll see that it's showing me a preview of what this is going to look like when I click and drag over my power lines. The clone brush is a great way to be a little bit more exact about your retouching. And I can make my brush a little bit, a little bit bigger so I can cover kind of a larger area here. And I can just start to click and drag. So this is a great way to do kind of quicker, quicker edits, but also more specific edits to your photo. And if there are any spots, just keep on option clicking on new areas. So I wouldn't want to start dragging, dragging down here on the bottom and start clicking and dragging because that's going to look a little weird. So I want to be very selective and I'm going to have to make sure I re-click that option key a couple of times. So always remember that you can click and drag, click and drag, and it does a great job of cleaning up that background. Now once I've got my brand new sky there in the top left hand corner, now I can take this into another program. I've gone in and I've cleaned up those power lines. I'm good to go. I want to take this into perfect effects. So using multiple modules here in the photo suite is great. It's, a, it's an awesome way to do something like this where you have to do a little bit of retouching and then you want to go in and you want to add effects or you want to take it into black and white. So multiple module editing here inside the photo suite is definitely recommended and it's a way that I use it on a pretty regular basis. Now, up in the top right hand corner, this is where all of the different modules sit. This is where they all kind of hang out. So you've got perfect layers, which is what we're using right now. And once I choose which program I want to go into, I just click and it'll swap me over into perfect effects. And now I can go in and I can make any edits here as well. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about some, some more advanced options inside perfect effects. On the left hand side inside the effects panel you'll notice that next to each one of these categories there's a little icon and it's kind of like a grid with a play button over it and this is our quick view browser and the quick view browser is a full screen browser that we added when we when we updated to 7.5 so it's it's brand new in 7.5 and it's a really really great way to view effects and take a look at them a little bit more close up so all I need to do is just choose a category. So I'm going to open up the sunshine category right here. I'll click on that quick view browser icon and it throws me into this full screen browser. And you'll see these are just nice big full previews of these effects. So we've got a golden hour enhancer. If I scroll down, we've got kind of a warm highlights filter here. You'll see the sky is getting a lot warmer as are all of these shadows. We've got kind of a glow that's going on here. So once I find one that I really like, I'm going to end up using this golden hour enhancer. I just click once and it applies that effect to my image. Now this effect is pretty, 
pretty heavy, I guess would be a good way of putting it. So it's pretty, it's pretty intense for this photo. So I want to go over and I want to reduce the effect just a little bit. On the right hand side of your screen, there's something called the effects stack. And this is where it's kind of like a layer stack in the sense that you can stack multiple effects on top of each other to create kind of your own look and your own preset. Now, underneath the stack, there's an amount slider. And the amount slider is an opacity slider. It allows you to reduce or increase the amount an effect is being applied to your image. So this golden hour enhancer is way too harsh. I wanna go in and I wanna reduce the amount a little bit. So I'll just take that slider and move it over to the left. And you'll see now it's warming up my image just a little bit, but it's not doing it too much. Now, I wanna add something on top of this effect here. I wanna go in and I wanna add, let's say, maybe a little bit more contrast. So inside that effect stack, I'll click on the Add button inside, inside that effect stack. I'll click on the Add button, and what that does is it adds an empty effect layer for me to apply a brand new effect. So it's really easy to go in and add multiple effects together. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to scroll up and I'm going to go to the landscape category or the contrast category. These are the two that I work with pretty regularly when I'm editing landscapes and, and they're usually the ones that I go to almost straight away when I'm editing a landscape. So let's start out with the landscape category. I can open it up in my quick view browser there and I can take a look at those nice full screen views. So we've got kind of a green enhancer, which is going to do some crazy stuff to the greens in the image. We've got kind of this autumn enhancer here, which is way too, way too heavy for this image. So I can scroll through and I can find one that I like. So I'm going to go up and I'm going to choose, scroll down, and I want to choose this one called Radiance. And the Radiance just adds a little bit of contrast and saturation to the image. So it's really simple, but it does a nice job. So I'll just click once on that to apply it to my photo, and there we go. And you'll see it just kind of increases everything in the photo. It just pumps it up a little bit. Now, the last thing that I want to do is add one more layer. So I'll click on the Add button, and I want to go in and I want to, let's say, add a border or a texture. It can be either. Depends on what you want to do. So I'll add a border for this image. So I'm going to go up to the top of my screen in the top of my effects library and we've got all of these different border categories here and we've separated them down to kind of make it a little bit easier to figure out which which border you want to apply. So if you really like kind of camera inspired borders we've got a special category just for that and we've got a special category just for kind of film inspired borders too. So you've got got lots of different categories to play around with. I'm going to go down to the bottom and open up the borders sloppy category. And this time I'll just open it right here in the effects library. I don't need that quick view browser this time. <coughs> and I can scroll through until I find a border that I really like. So I'm going to use this one called sloppy border 5. And I'll click to apply it. And there we go. Now inside Perfect Effects, when you combine multiple layers together, you have access to creating something called a preset. And a preset is a way to, to, to save your work in a way inside Perfect Effects. So let's save these three, three layers that we combine, that Golden and Hour, Hour Enhancer, that Radiance Filter, and then this Sloppy Border. Let's save it as a preset so we can reapply it to another image. So I'll go up to my Preset menu on the top left-hand side and choose Save Preset. Now I can give it a name if I want to. So I could call this a Golden Hour with Border Preset. And I'm usually pretty boring with my preset names. I always recommend that people give it a name that you'll actually remember what it is. If you give it a name where it's something kind of funky, you may not necessarily remember what you what you use this preset for. And I, I make a lot of presets. I love making presets. Um, and I use them pretty much all the time for my personal work and my professional work. So, so always make sure you give your preset a, a pretty good and pretty smart name um, so you can find it later. Now, you can place it in a category here, and you'll see when I open up the category drop-down menu, I actually separate my presets down into 
the type of preset I'm saving them as. So I've got vintage film inspired presets, portrait presets, wedding presets, all different kinds. So I recommend that you create a couple categories so that you can separate down your presets so they're easier to find later. And then I can type in a creator and a description. And the description can be a good way to help you remember why you created this preset in the first place. So once I click create, it pops into my presets library on the left hand side. So we're inside the effects library now. Here's my favorites library and then right next to it is my presets. And my presets are separated down into those categories that we just saw. So I'll open up landscape presets and we'll scroll down and here is the golden hour with border preset. Now to apply a preset, let me start from scratch. So my original image, I've done nothing to it. Let's say I want to apply a preset to this image. I'm going to go down and let's, let's find a vintage film one that's really, really fun. So open up the vintage film category here. And I want to go in and I want to add this really cool light leak film look. So I'll click on this preset and it applies it to my image. That's going to go in and do its little magic. And then on the right hand side of my screen, you'll see that inside the effects stack, it appears as though it only applied this preset in one layer. That is false. It actually saved all of the layers that went into creating this preset. So if I click on the expand button inside my effects stack, I can see all three of the layers that were used to make this effect. So now if I want to, I can go to each one and I can edit them. Let's say this mayor effect here, which is this really intense light leak. I don't really like the way that it looks. I want to reduce the amount quite a bit because I don't, I don't really like how it looks on, on this photo or in this preset. So I can take the amount slider and move it to the left. And now I've customized this preset specifically for this image. So presets are constantly customizable and you can always go back in and re-edit each one of these layers separately. Now, the next thing that I wanna to talk to you guys about is I'm gonna click on the apply button here and it'll pop me back into perfect layers. Do, 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 it's gonna go in and it's gonna add all these different effects and process all of them here. And when we pop it back into perfect layers, it's going to smush all of the different effect layers that we applied into one single perfect effects layer. So let's go through and apply all these different effects here. When you add a lot of different layers, it may take probably about 45 seconds at the longest. It doesn't process very long. This is a huge file and it did it that quick. So don't worry about it processing a really long time. It's usually less than 30 or 45 seconds. So it's nice and quick. Now, what it did is it popped me back into perfect layers. Because I opened the suite kind of, kind of so that I could edit in multiple modules, it's not gonna put me back into Lightroom until I'm done, until I'm ready to exit. So on the right-hand side of my screen, inside perfect layers, here's my perfect effects layer on top of my original photo layer. So I can turn my layer visibility on and off by clicking the eye icon next to each layer. So let me turn this perfect effects layer on. This is my original image. And I can turn that eye icon back on. And here is my new perfect effects image. Now, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is masking. And I'm actually going to, before I talk about mask, I'm actually going to talk about the saving option here. So you'll see in the bottom left hand, right hand corner of the screen, there's a save button. I'm going to click on save. And it's going to go in and it's going to save this PSD file with all the different layers that I used to create it. And it's actually going to leave me here. When I click on the close button, it's going to close that image up. And I'm going to pop back to Lightroom. And once I'm back in Lightroom, you'll see that right next to my original image, let me go to my, my grid view here so you can actually see it. Right next to my original image here, this, this with the with the power lines in the top left hand corner and with no effects applied, right next to it is my brand new edited copy. Because I started out with a raw file which is straight out of my camera, it automatically created that digital copy for me and I didn't have to worry about destroying my original image. So one of the many, 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 many plus sides of working with raw files. Now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about masking next. So I'm going to go in 
and I am going to select this image here and I want to go in and this is a PSD file and this PSD file I actually this is this might I have the original raw file but I saved it as a PSD and I don't know where the original raw file is if I go up to the file menu and I go down to plug in extras and choose the perfect photo suite it's not going to create a digital copy automatically for me because this isn't a raw file. It's actually just going to save layers on top of my original photo in this PSD file. So it won't create a digital copy for me. So if you're working with PSD files or possibly TIFF files, you want to right click on your image here inside Lightroom. So I'm going to do that right now. And when you right click on the image and go to edit in, you'll see I have a selective amount of modules here. And the reason why I like to do this is because if I go into the edit in menu and I choose, let's say, perfect effects, it'll open up this little dialog box magically. It'll open up a dialog box that says that I can create a copy of my original image. And this is one of the most important parts about working inside Lightroom and working Working with PSD files, TIFF files, JPEG files, you want to be able to create a digital copy of that image. And creating a digital copy is something that's that's very, very, very important. I think Lightroom just froze up on me. Per. So if you're working with, let's go ahead and restart Lightroom, and I'll just talk about masking with another program here. So let's pop over to the suite and I'll just show you guys masking through here. And actually I can talk to you about the suite as a standalone program and we'll still talk about masking. On the left hand side of the screen when you're working with a standalone program here, there's something called the browser. And to open up the program as a standalone, all you need to do is just click on the icon. I have it in my dock on my computer because I use it as a standalone pretty regularly because I like to just go into perfect effects and layers and then export from there. You'll find it inside your applications folder on your computer and you can either pop it in your dock or if you find it, you just double click on it. And what's really great about using the program as a standalone is it automatically opens up inside perfect layers. So here inside perfect layers, on the left hand side, I can browse through all of my different photos on my computer. So you'll see here's my desktop. So I'll click on my desktop there. And these are folders on my desktop. So I'll click on, let's say we want to open up the Liz's photo category. So these are a whole bunch of my images and folders of my images. And let's go down and let's choose just one of the random folders here and we'll open up some images. So these are all photos on my actual computer. These are all photos on my actual desktop that I use for, for webinars and for video tutorials and all different types of all different types of things. Now what's really cool about using the browser is you also have access to using the Quick View browser, the one that I talked about earlier inside Perfect Effects. So it's here inside Perfect Layers inside the browser as well. So to open up the Quick View browser, that same little grid play button icon is in the bottom left hand corner of the browser. You'll see it right at the bottom of the screen here. And when I click on that, it opens up whatever folder I'm in inside this quick view full screen browser. And I can scroll through and I can find an image that I want to work with. And you see I've got lots of duplicates of images and ones that are edited and ones that aren't. Um, I use these photos quite a bit for, for webinars, so these are duplicate files of a lot of things that I edit. So let's scroll up and let's choose this image here. Now once I find an image that I want to go in and edit, I just click once and it opens up that file for me. I don't have to double click, I don't have to do anything. Now this photo is, like I was talking about earlier, this is a PSD file. When I take this image and pop it into Perfect Effects, we're going to add some effects to this and I want to talk to you about basic masking techniques inside the program. So let's let's go in and let's add an effect and let's add something that's 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 pretty pretty basic. Let's go in and let's add some contrast. So I'll open up the contrast category here and you'll see I've got I've got some really nice basic ones and one of my favorite is called the daily vitamin. And I'll click on this effect and I'll show you why. 
it goes in and it adds contrast, it adds a little bit of clarity to the image, it adds a little bit of intensity to the color, it kind of just goes in and it does everything that you really want in a landscape image. This is one of those presets that I use a lot in my personal personal work because it just kind of like goes over and it just pumps the image up a little bit. So the daily vitamin effect is one I use all the time. So I've applied it to my image, but let's just, let's just say that I don't like it on my entire photo. Let's say I, I, I don't like it on the top part of my image. I want to, I want to remove it. There are two different tools that you can use to mask out and remove the effect from the top part of your image. The first one is called the masking bug. And the masking bug creates a mask that's either rectangular or circular. And the circular can be oval, can be a perfect circle, it can be a long oval, short oval, it can be anything. So it's kind of a round, round bug. And it creates this basic size for you. And the, the rectangular masking bug is great for working with images that have horizon lines. So you, if you just have a top and a bottom that you want to combine together, if you have just the top half of your photo you want to apply an effect to and the bottom half you don't, this masking bug is awesome. It's really, really useful. So I selected that masking bug and I'm going to click on my image to apply it. And you'll see I get this kind of weird little bug that pops up in the center of my image. On the right hand side of the screen, I have these, on the right hand side of the bug, in, inside my screen, I have these little arms. And this allows you to change the size of the bug. So I click and drag and you'll see that there's this grid that pops up. The grid, whatever the grid is over, it's removing the effect from the image. So you'll see when I drag this grid across my whole image, now my photo isn't being affected by that daily vitamin layer. When I shrink it down, everywhere except for this little tiny sliver is being affected. So I can drag to resize this bug. I can click inside it to drag it up and down. So if I want to drag it to match a horizon line, I can go in and do that. The next thing I can do is edit something called the feathering. So you want to make sure that there's a nice soft edge between the top and the bottom. You want that transition to be nice and soft. So I'm going to leave the feathering the way that it is. And now you'll see the bottom part of my image is a little bit more intense and the top part of my image is a little bit lighter. So I can turn my preview on and off and you'll see the bottom gets a little bit more intense. When I turn the effect off, it's getting kind of flat again. Now, the next thing that I want to do is I want to make sure that this mountain is nice and crisp. I want all of that detail, all that contrast, all that saturation to be back into this mountain. There's another tool that you have access to, and it's called the Perfect Brush, and it's the Masking Brush Tool. So the Masking Brush Tool has access to our Perfect Brush, which is our edge detection brush. So I'll click on that Masking Brush there, and you'll see a little brush pops up. And I want to go up to the top part of my screen and I want to choose the perfect brush. I want to make sure that that checkbox is checked. So now what I want to do is I want to paint back in the effect that we lost on this mountain. So I'm going to make sure in my tool options bar right up at the top of my screen, my mode is set to paint in. I want to bring the effect back to the mountain and paint it back in. I want to make sure that my opacity is 100%. I want to paint it back in at 100%. And then all I need to do is make my brush whatever size I want and just start clicking and painting. And as, as I paint over the mountain, it's only affecting the mountain and it's leaving everything else alone. So it's leaving that sky alone, it's leaving, it's leaving all the clouds alone, and it's only painting over that mountain. This is a great, great, great way to selectively edit your image. This is something that happens all the time when you have a photo and you're really frustrated because you can't get into all those little tiny cracks and crevices. You've got a mountain like this, and you don't want to have to go in and hand paint around to the edge of this mountain. You want to be able to just have it have it be done for you a lot quicker. And that's what that's what this masking tool is there for. So I'm going to go in and just make sure that this whole bottom area is nice and bright. And there we go. So now the bottom part of my image has been pumped up, and the back part of my image is nice and soft. I can turn that preview on and off so you guys can see that original photo. Here's my original image and then here's just the bottom part of my photo pumped up. So let's go ahead and let's let's cancel out of this and I want to show you the masking tools here inside Perfect Layers really quick so you guys can actually see how these work. 
let me close this image here. Don't save. Now, let's say you have two different photos that you want to combine together. So I'm going to go into our browser here. And I'm actually going to open up some of the on one sample images that come with the program. And these are really, really great to practice with. I like to touch on these sometimes in, in webinars because some people don't have photos that they can practice with on a regular basis or they don't have ones they think would work. And we actually give you these samples that you can play around with and they automatically come with the suite. And they're usually in your pictures folder on your computer. And these are the samples here. We've got one for portrait. We've got a couple for effects and resize. And we've got some that work great for black and white and focal point. These two right here, you'll see that I have a sky image where the sky is nice and nice and bright and has that really intense sunset. And then there's an image right underneath where it's been exposed for the water. So two different photos that we want to open and combine together. So the first thing I need to do is open up that first image. We'll open up the sky. So I'll just double click and it'll open up that image for me. Now I want to add the other image on top of it. So you can combine two images together. So I'll click on this water image. I'll double click that and opens up this little dialog box first. It asks me whether I want to add this as a new layer on top of my sky photo, or whether I want to create a completely new image and erase that sky image altogether. I always want to click on the Add button because it automatically adds this photo as a brand new layer. Now once I've done that, all I need to do is mask out the boring sky in this image and bring out the one that's right underneath. So we have the masking bug and the masking brush here inside Perfect Layers as well. So you can use both of those same tools that we just used inside Perfect Effects here inside Perfect Layers. So let me choose my masking bug and I'll click inside my image and I'll add that to my photo. And now I'll do exactly what I did before. I'll, I'll drag it to resize it. And we want to make sure I can make it a little bit smaller than that. I want to make sure that it lines up nice right along the edge of that horizon. So I'll just click and drag until it's in place. Once it's there and in place, I can edit that feathering amount. So if the feathering is a little too intense, I can lessen that a bit more. I can also increase the feathering so it's a little bit of a softer, softer transition from the top to the bottom of the image. So play around with that feathering amount. That can be really, really, really useful. And there we go. We've combined the top part of one image and the bottom part of another image. And it's nice and easy here inside your layer stack. You'll see that top image, the water image. The top part of my photo is blacked out, so we don't have to see that boring, highly exposed sky. And it's revealing the sky photograph right underneath. And I always say that, that masking works kind of like, like a stack of papers. If the paper is really thin, You've reduced the opacity. If you want to see something underneath that top paper, you just cut out a hole, and that's kind of what masking is. You're like cutting out little parts of a piece of paper so you can see the other paper underneath it. Um, so if you ever take a stack of paper and you just you have a red piece on the bottom and a brown piece on top, if you cut a hole in the brown piece, you'll be able to see that red red piece of paper. And that's that's always that's always a helpful way of kind of remembering what masking does and how it works. Whatever's on top, you'll see until you remove part of it to reveal something underneath. Now, the last thing that I want to talk to you about is some of the differences between file types. And I've been talking about them kind of offhand, and we always get a ton of questions about file types and which ones are which ones are more useful and, and which ones people should be using and shouldn't be using. And there, there are always tons of questions about file types. So I want to talk to you about a couple of the different file types here inside, inside any program that you're going to use. So the first is called a raw file. And raw files are, are a way for you to access a huge tonal range inside an original image. So you, you create a setting on your, on your camera. It's right there on your camera. And you make sure that your file type is saved as raw. And what it does is it looks at a scene, let's say like this one, and it tries to pull in as much information as possible in blown out highlights, in deep shadows, and in all of the midtones in between. Now, when you're working with raw files, it's the largest amount of information you can get in a file. It's amazing. 
The best part about working with raw files is you never can ever, ever, ever overwrite your original. The raw file can never, ever be saved over. So even if you make changes inside, let's say, Lightroom. So you go into Lightroom and you open up a raw file and you go to your little develop module and you make a couple thing changes like, you know, you edit the contrast or you edit the exposure a little bit. Those changes will never, ever, ever, ever be automatically saved on your image. You will always, always, always be able to go back to your original file. And when you work with raw files in any program, it automatically creates a digital copy for you so that you don't destroy that original photo. So when you're working inside the suite, it'll automatically create a PSD file for you or whatever file you decide to choose. Um, it'll automatically create a copy for you so that you don't destroy that original. Now, the other file types that are the most popular are PSD files, which I've talked a lot about, TIFF files, and JPEGs. A lot of people take pictures with JPEGs because they're nice and small and they're very, very easy to use. So you can take, instead of when you shoot raw files, sometimes if you have a nice big card inside your camera, sometimes you can shoot 350 pictures. When you swap your file format over to JPEG, you can take upwards of a thousand pictures. So there's a huge difference in size. And JPEGs are typically what people use when they're uploading images to the web. They're small, they're easy, and they're they're very, they're very quick to save. So if you have a lot of images and you you want to make sure that you want to make sure that you have enough space for all those photos, a lot of people save them as JPEGs. So JPEGs are kind of on the smaller end. Right in between are two other file types called TIFF and PSD. PSD files are typically what I use, and I recommend them to anybody who's doing a layered workflow like I've been doing where I like to combine two images together. I want to go in and edit out part of my image. I want to add an effect layer and then maybe a, a focal point layer. And then I want to go into perfect portrait. I want to make sure that the layered workflow is something that I have access to. And PSD files are kind of the closest thing you can get to, to editing raw files. They give you a huge range of information there. So you always have access to a very, very large portion of your original image. You have access to saving multiple different layers and layer types, which is really, really useful. So if you like to do a lot of things like I've been doing where you, again, combine multiple images and add lots of different effects and, and, and lots of other cool things, you want to mask out a background and then you want to resize it, PSDs are going to be the way to go. PSDs, however, only work in specific applications. So they're going to work in Photoshop and Lightroom they're going to work here inside the perfect photo suite, and they're going to work inside Aperture. But other than that, they're not going to work in a lot of other file, filed applications. So if you sent, you know, this PSD file to a friend of yours who doesn't have any of those programs, they're not going to be able to view the image. You can't take a PSD file and put it up online and have everybody look at it. So PSDs are just files that you use while you're editing. And then TIFF files are kind of the in-between. TIFF files have almost as much information as a PSD file does. However, it's kind of a universal file type. Pretty much anybody can view a TIFF file, which is great. Mac, Windows, doesn't matter. You can view it in tons of different applications. So if somebody doesn't have Photoshop and they want to be able to look at a photo, they can probably view a TIFF file. JPEGs are the same way. Most people can view JPEGs as well. So it just depends on what you like to do. I like to use PSD files. You have a larger layered workflow and they're the easiest to use when you're editing.